Hello, everyone. Welcome to our event. This event is brought to you by Data Talks Club, which is a community of people who love data. We have weekly events. This event is one of such events. If you want to find out more about the events we have in our schedule, there is a link in the description. Go there, click on this link, and check out everything we have in our pipeline. We have quite a few uh, events lined up, so check them out. Especially we have uh, quite uh, a few workshops that will be quite interesting, so do check it out. Then if you, for whatever reason, haven't subscribed yet to our YouTube channel, now is the best time to do this. Just click on this red button and then you will uh, know about all the videos we have on our channel. And then finally, last but not least, uh, we have an amazing Slack community where you can talk to other data enthusiasts. So check it out, register there. And during today's interview, you can ask any question you want. There is a pinned link in the live chat. Click on this link, ask your question, and I will be covering these questions during the interview. So that's all for the introduction. Now let me stop sharing my screen. And by the way, I forgot to do, I usually do a picture, make a picture and then share this picture on Twitter. So maybe you can, can you smile? And then I'll take a picture. Okay. Oops. Cool. So I took, took a picture, now I will share it on Twitter. Okay. Are you active on Twitter or not so much? I'm Mostly just LinkedIn, starting. right? Yeah, I just started, but I've not been really active there. Hoping to do more, hopefully. Okay. So let's start. Okay, so this week we'll talk about visualizing machine learning. And we have a special guest today, Meor. You probably saw uh, Meor on LinkedIn, where he shares amazing visualization about different machine learning concepts. Um, one of the last ones I remember well about uh, was about drift in machine learning. Right? That was a, a pretty cool one. So uh, yeah, he shared, how often do you actually post things? I see you quite regularly there, like weekly, right? Yeah, uh, so I used to, so I started uh, sometime media last year. So I was doing almost one visual every day. Mm -hmm. But now because of other commitments, I'm starting to do a bit less, but I'm hoping to uh, put more uh, visuals soon and go back to mm -hmm. my earlier cadence. So hopefully that will come soon. Yeah. Uh, you also wrote a book about neural networks where you use this visualization. So do check it out. So yeah, welcome to our event. Thank you for having me, Alexei. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Yeah. Before we go into our main topic of visualization, visualizing machine learning, let's start with your background. Can you tell us about your career journey so far? Yeah, sure. So um, I was introduced to machine learning quite some time ago, almost 10 years ago now. Uh, so back then, I was interested in doing research in uh, limb prosthetics. Uh, and I decided to uh, stop whatever I was doing in my career and uh, do a master's degree doing research in that. And that was when I was introduced to machine learning, which is the technology or the algorithm that's powering the, the whole industry. So I did this master's in bioengineering with a view of doing a PhD. But I stopped after the master's and I didn't continue with the PhD because uh, one of the reasons that, is that back then the the uh, excitement around AI and machine learning was totally not like what it is today. So the research was relatively uh, slow. There was not much breakthrough. And one of the reasons that I didn't really see the application in the, in the real world at the time. So I decided to go uh, back into um, working. So I, I, I joined a company in the telecommunications industry that does um, data platforms, uh, doing data engineering for telecommunications data uh, and doing analytics on top of it. So I did that for around six, seven years. But what I've always wanted to do for quite some time was in education, be it an adult or even childhood education. Um, so in 2019, around two years back, I decided that I wanted to do something else. So I went uh, into self-employment mode. So I, I became in, an independent consultant. Initially, I was doing um, uh, training and consultancy in the area I was related to back then, which is telecommunications, analytics. And slowly, I moved into um, 
education in a childhood uh, space, which is tying back to what I've also the other area that I wanted to, I've always wanted to do, which is AI and machine learning, which I um, revived my interest in the past couple of years. So I did um, AI educational resources for middle schools and high schools uh, under the name of EdSquare. So it's still there. Uh, and that was happening right until middle of last year when I encountered this way of, uh, of uh, I mean, a fun way of, of creating educational materials for adults, uh, which is using visual. So I came upon this, this approach and I just, uh, without any background in, in design at all, so I was just trying to um, apply uh, visuals into uh, explaining the concept of machine learning. So that's when I started to create these visuals under the name of K Dimensions. So it has been going on for for yeah almost yeah nine eight nine months now. So that's that's where I am at currently. So while I was doing other things, I, I'm still doing the other things that I started uh, before, but slowly my focus is uh, is now in uh, under K Dimensions. So why this name? That, that's ah, nice. so, yeah. <laughs> so when you know it's quite obvious because um, it borrows from the concept of machine learning, uh, dimensionality, dimensionality reduction. So for example, if you talk about um, a machine learning problem, right? So you have a data that is very big, uh, let's say thousand of, uh, thousands of features. So what you can do is that you can compress it into a, 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 a number of features that is much less than what it is before while maintaining the same amount of information. So that's the concept behind PCA and all the different algorithms that, that falls under dimensionality reduction. So that's the, the same idea that we, I had with visual as well. And I think that's where the power of visuals come in is that with just a visual, you'll be able to compress a lot of information that you would otherwise have to write it down and a bit harder for people to comprehend and for people to digest. With a visual, you of course won't retain the same information as what you can explain with the text, but you can uh, go straight to the essence and people can get it immediately. So that's the idea. So K is uh, uh, the common, the common um, uh, alphabet that people use uh, while, while reducing the dimensions from N dimensions to K dimensions. Mm -hmm. When okay. people do, do PCA. So, so that's where the name came from. I suspected. Yeah, that, that's... Uh idea like to name it uh, it makes total sense like you take a complex idea then you uh, simplify it and you reduce sort of dimensionality of this idea right that's cool and yeah so in 2019 you became self-employed and you started being an independent consultant right and you started also working on these visuals was it scary for you to um you know go solo yeah it was but i it was because I've wa always wanted to do it for a long time, even after I completed my 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 masters. Because I, from then then on, I I wanted to do something in the education space. And throughout um, my career with with the company I was in before, I was doing some other small ventures in education, especially childhood education. But of course, with the uh, cushion of having a, a job, you you don't really put the full commitment because somehow you have this something that you can fall back uh, on. But I thought the, the time was just right for me to do it fully. So I didn't really have a clear plan. I do have some idea. So I just went into it and yeah, luckily I'm, I'm, I'm managing well so far. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I know that there is a guy called uh, Jack Butcher and uh, he has, I think he's, uh, uh, he has a Twitter, um, profile called Visualize Value, uh, probably a website as well. And I see some similarities in what you do and what uh, Jack is doing. Um, did you get the inspiration from him with coming uh, up with all these visuals? Uh, or uh, what kind of sources of inspirations did you have when you decided, OK, I want to follow this format and I want to create visuals in such a way that you create right now? So how, how did it uh, start for you? Yeah, in, in fact, it started with, with him because I was browsing through my feed and came upon this very simple and minimal visual but give, that that gives a, a, a big weight in terms of the the, the if, i mean the the perspective or the message that he wants to bring so i've never seen such visuals 
um, and I started to dig deep into his approach and his his way of doing things. I enrolled in his course called How to Visualize Value, uh, which explains how he goes through this process of making visuals and the idea be behind it, the philosophy behind it. I was mind blown because it's a concept that even though it looks, it looks, I wouldn't say I wouldn't say he's the first one who have done it, but he has definitely is the one that has brought it mainstream and he's the one that really can relate to a lot of people. Um, I, I, I still haven't figured out the right term for, for this whole category yet, but the closest I can find is, I think, visual engineering. So, of course, it's not the engineering in the technical sense, but it's about using visuals for you to convey a message that's, that's unlike a normal way for you to, that you normally do for, for you to create visuals. Or, I, I can put it this way. Um, there is a way of for you to create visuals that attach to a text or a message that you are, you are trying to say. But there is a way for you to create a visual that amplifies or um, make better what you are trying to, to convey. And Jack's uh, visuals falls, uh, falls under this latter category. So I, I was, I was uh, amazed. So that's when uh, it all started for me. I started to try to, uh, yeah, so I thought that might as well uh, because I was already doing um, uh, machine learning educational materials back then with, uh, primarily with Ad Square for childhood education. But I thought that I could apply the same thing. So simplify, simplifying machine learning concepts and applying it using visuals. And of course, there are many, many reasons uh, to do it. And the, the, one of the reasons is that I think at the moment, there's just uh, more information that we need uh, when it comes to learning mach machine learning, because yeah, there are so many resources. There are courses, there are books, um, there are blog posts, uh, code examples, it goes on. Uh, so the question now is not about how you, um, how you create additional material. I think the question now is how do you curate this content or maybe more accurately, how do you condense this content into something that is digestible for people. And I mean, it's really an interesting industry to be to be in right now because a lot of people are interested in this subject and area. Um, people are really uh, motivated to learn. And I hope to be able to, to give them a way for them to learn at least um, to enter, to, to give an entry for them to be able to, to, to get in, get get into the door for them before they explore things in more detail, for them to be able to grasp the concepts in a simple way to get it in terms of at the intuition level before they go further into uh, into into what they are doing. But of course, it's not just Jack. There are many other people I look up to. And even in the machine learning space, there are already a lot of uh, very talented uh, people who are already creating visuals that explain concepts in machine learning. So first and foremost for me is Jay, uh, Jay Alamar, who has this blog that explains uh, concept around mostly um, neural networks. So for example, go to VEC, uh, Transformers, who has this fa famous blog post, Illustrated Transformers, and has a lot of other kinds of materials as well. So yeah, so that's a resource that I, I go to for me to understand these concepts myself. And I found it really relatable for me to visually look at the concepts and get the intuition before going into the math, before going into the code. And there are other, that, I mean, the list goes on. For example, StatQuest, uh, Josh Starmer, that, that really simplifies the understanding of machine learning and data science using visuals by way of video. Uh, Luis Serrano as well. So he has this book, Rocking Machine Learning. I'm sure uh, you know. Um, yeah, he, he also provide, uh, creates wonderful videos that explains these concepts. So I think with visuals, then you pair that with, with code and math, I think, it will make sense when you go uh, deeper into into any subject uh, in this field. So yeah. yeah so so you were already in education. So you were already uh, in this education space, and then you were browsing through your feed, and then you saw a visual from Jack Butcher, right? And you yeah. thought, okay, this is so cool. I want to do something similar. And then this is how it started, right? And actually, when I saw uh, also uh, images from Jack, I thought mm, it would, could would be cool if somebody does something similar for machine learning. And then uh, a few months after that, uh, I saw you on LinkedIn. 
And that was it. I thought, okay, like this is, uh, it's like as if Jack well, was doing this thing. Cool. And I remember I was listening to a podcast with him. I didn't take a course. I was listening to a podcast and he said that he on purpose restricts himself. So he restricts himself. He only uses, well, I don't know, one, two colors, right? He only uses simple shapes. Um, what else is there? Yeah, so exactly. Remember? So he, he, there are, I mean, other than visuals, he also have a lot of very interesting perspectives about visuals and beyond visuals. And one, one of the things that you mentioned is exactly one of the things that I took away from him is that um, basically you have to introduce constraints in, in the work that you do. I think it's true for visuals and I think it's true for anything that you do in life as well. So whenever, especially when you're creating something. Um, for him is into yeah like exactly like you said so just two colors black and white geometrical shapes uh, abstract concepts that's it so there are there is this thing that uh, that creative uh, constraints breed creativity so it's like it's it's it's, it's ironical that that uh, uh, that that is the case because people would think that for you to be able to be creative you have to have a lot of resource with you you have to have for example talent you have to have a lot of you have to know uh, tools, you have to know a lot of um, ideas. So that is true. But the, looking at it from the other, the other perspective is that when you introduce constraints, you're forced to work with only what you have. So that's when you get focused and you're not really worried about the other things that you can do, the other things that, that is also uh, beneficial to you for you to create something. You don't, you don't worry about it. You just work on what you have. And yeah, like what you see with the visual that Jack does, you can do amazing things uh, with with the constraint that you impose on yourself. And I think for you, you use only three colors, right? So the yeah, background me, is always green. Yeah. Right? So yeah. So for me, uh, because for me, it's about explaining a technical concept, and you you're talking about um, sometimes concepts that are very deep in terms of the things that you want to explain. There are a lot more there. So I tried to use as uh, like two two colors. It didn't work. So. Uh, yeah, so I use three colors. So the background is dark and just three main colors. Uh, so red, white, and uh, blue. Um, so so yeah, I found that that is the right equilibrium for me to, to, to work on. Even though there are times when I think I still need to have some other shades, but I try to keep myself to, to that. And yeah, um, it has really uh, served me well so far. How do you come up with these ideas? Um, like to where do you see them? So, so I think there are, I think there are many ways to do it. So my uh, the approach that I found to be working well is first to introduce the con constraint, and the constraint can be can be coming from different. There are different types. So one is the style constraint that we have just um, discussed about. The other thing is that for you to introduce constraint in terms of the time. So maybe you set a time. Okay, before that, you have to introduce constraints of the topic. So let's say there's a topic that you want to visualize. Even though you are not sure how you're going to make it, you don't go into the next topic. Let's say brief, like what you mentioned just now. So I will stick with just brief. I, I, I'll make sure that I will be able to create some kind of visual related to brief before going on to other topics. And once you have the topic, you introduce a time constraint, which is within just a, like a few minutes, for example, you just put it down on paper, whatever you have in your mind. And that's, I think, when the magic happens, because the moment you have something written or sketched, that's when you can improve on it, on, on it because you cannot improve on things that is, is blank, but you can definitely improve on, on things that are that are already there, no matter how, how ugly it looks and no matter how, how uh, different it looks from what you, you would imagine it in, 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 in the end. The other thing that um, you can do is for you to... Um, so yeah, so the other thing, so 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 constraints is one thing. The other thing that I found it uh, to be to be working for me is for, uh, to try to visualize. How do I say this? To try to visualize um, um, things, not what it is, but what it means. So so let me try to rephrase that. So when you try to visualize a concept. Um, uh, what I learned from Jack is that, from his visual, is that um, you don't try to visualize the noun, which is what it is, but visualize or try to extract what is the verb or the adjective. 
So that's when you are able to extract the message that you want to 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 deliver. Again, using this brief example, uh, so I was using this this visual of um, a catapult throwing throwing this ball into into basket, right? So so the idea that I had at the time is that is about accuracy. So it's not about model because if you are thinking about models, if you're talking about algorithms, then you're stuck with maybe boxes and squares and rectangles and arrows. So that's 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 one way of doing things. But I think that is looking from the logical uh, point of view, which is what it is, the noun of what you're trying to represent. But if you try to understand what it's trying to do, which is trying to uh, to be accurate, then, then, then that's when you start to think about what kind of metaphors, what kind of objects that you can also use to represent. Uh, and that brings another, another benefit, which is um, using metaphors, using objects that people can relate with makes it very, very less intim intimidating for people to understand a concept. Because the moment, for example, you start to use rectangles and arrows, people can get the idea, but not quite. They, they, they feel like they are not yet attached to the idea, but the moment you, uh, you start to show everyday objects, everyday things, uh, at least they get the object, and then that becomes the bridge for them to understand the real concept that you want to, you want to represent. So metaphors and abstract concepts, uh, yeah, probably are the, the two uh, things that you may want to look into if you are trying to visualize things. Okay, so first you think, okay, I want to create something on, let's say, drift. And then you give yourself a bit of time, I don't know, to use a timer, maybe um, yeah. set it to five, 10 minutes, something like this, right? And then you start brainstorming. How exactly, what kind of, how can I show the action? What is the action there? What is the verb? In this, uh, in this drift, because drift is a noun, as you said, right? But what is an action? And the action is, I think, the catapult, the catapult you used, it's missing, right? It's not, yes. uh, it cannot uh, hit uh, the, what was there, like at a baseball? Yeah, it's about, it, um, thing. yeah, so for the original model, it's, it's just a basket. Uh, with data drift, you are, you are, I mean, you are looking at the catapult not really functioning well, or the ball have changed its shape, for example which caused the catapult not really hitting the target. So that's about the data itself, the source. Uh, whereas concept drift is about the target itself that you are changing. So from a basket, you're changing it to a, uh, to a basketball game, for example, which is a higher, um, uh, in this case, a higher higher target. So you need to adapt your source to, to match, to match uh, the target that you have just changed. So I can give another example um, uh, that I found, I think, really, uh, uh, interesting as well to me is that because I was trying to 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 understand and internalize the concept of data data centric AI, which is also uh, being popularized these days. Uh, so when people talk about data centric AI, it does not mean that we are um, being relaxed on the model development itself. What we are saying here is that we have focused so much on the model development, fine tuning, and all that but not so much focusing on the data. So the moment we talk about data-centric AI, by the term, maybe people can think, will think that it is about um, primarily about the data, but not so much on the model. The model is there as it is, but the fact is that you need to have both. You need to have balance. So that's when I thought about the, the adjective that, that represents the idea is about balance. So that's when I, I uh, figured out this idea to draw the concept of aeroplane. Uh, whereby one side of the wing is of a modern aircraft and the other side is less developed, which is like uh, the wings from the 50s, for example. So the idea is that for the aircraft to function well, you need to develop both sides to have balance. So the, I just put like, yeah, algorithms on one side and data on the other side. So it's not like one over the other, but both uh, at the same time. And people yeah, seem maybe... to be able to relate to that, yeah. yeah. Can you walk us through the process? So let's say about the, uh, I don't know, catapult or the airplane. Mm -hmm. Like how, uh, from the moment you got an idea, I don't know if, uh, how it appeared, like first, did you want to create something on data-centric AI? Or first you had an image of your plane in your head and then uh, you did this. Like maybe you can walk us through the entire process from the very beginning before you even started working on this to the end where you publish this on LinkedIn. How does it yeah, like? so so to be honest, I don't have any like a very rigid idea, but what 
I normally do is that, um, I mean, whatever I'm learning, whatever I'm reading on that day, uh, whatever that's interesting, I will list down the concepts. And especially because um, I mentioned about me starting machine learning quite some time ago, but the fact is that I have left the field for quite some time. And in, in, only in the past couple of years, I started to revive my interest. So all this is also, first and foremost, is for me, uh, is part of my relearning journey. So whenever I'm reading a new concept, whenever I'm trying to understand a new um, a new, yeah, a new material. Uh, first and foremost, for me to be able to understand the concept and for me to be able to get to the core of the message, um, I'll just list down the concepts without, without, I mean, adding any visuals. I'll just list down things that I found interesting that I read, um, new concepts that I've learned, and put in, put them in, in, in a long list because not always the idea will come immediately. So, so the moment you you start to have the list. You can, prob I mean, I would, for, for example, review it uh, on a weekly basis. Uh, if I found something, I mean, a theme that is always occurring from what I'm le learning and reading during that week, I, uh, that I thought would be interesting for me to, to nail my understanding, I would put it like in a shortlist for me to visualize. So once I, I've got the shortlist, then only I try to figure out the, the way for me to visualize these concepts. And like what I mentioned just now, I just try to elaborate a bit more now, is that for now, what's been working for me is that for me to understand the visuals, uh, for me to be able to create visuals that uh, is understandable, it can fall under these two main categories. One is metaphors, the other one is abstract concepts. Uh, abstract means uh, like what Jack Butcher is doing, like just basic uh, shapes, basic, basic arrows and lines um, you 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 try to create something out of it. Um, so that's when I start to think about uh, back to what, what I was saying just now. Like for each concept that I want to visualize, what is the the key message? So I think that's also part of the um, uh, learning aspect that when you are trying to learning something, uh, to learn something, what you want to try to get to is that what is the essence of the concept that you're trying to learn for example uh, uh yeah back to drift the essence is what you're trying to learn is that things are changing uh whether from a source or from a target and you're trying to trying to adapt to that so that's that's the 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 the, the concept that you try to get to the bottom to and from there um yeah you decide on how you want to do it you decide on what kind of, i mean you try to figure out what's the verb what the message what's the key message what it means and then you try to, to to translate that into visual. So there are there are there are, I would say, different kinds of categories of the kinds of visuals that I find interesting for me to make. One is concept, uh, like a concept machine learning, like data centric AI and uh, drifts uh, and, and all this. But the other thing is that is also very interesting to 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 visualize is the emotional aspect. When I say emotional, I'm talking about the realities in the field. Um, for example, what people say uh, machine learning is and what it really is in the field, because people can relate to that. Uh, for example, when we talk about um, creating a data science project and a data science solutions, right? Um, so normally what you want to do is you start with a problem, then you work your way towards the solution. But um, uh, a lot of people, me first and foremost, are always guilty to, to start with a solution first. And be able to and, and work backwards to try to find a problem that can be solved by solution because you're so invested and you're so interested in the algorithm or the solution that you are you are you're building. So yeah, what if you can visualize that? What if you can just show that actually you the arrow should be from the left to right, but what you're doing is from the left to right. So you try to touch these emotional points in uh from, from the, the viewer that they, they can totally relate and they can totally understand where, where you're coming from. So that's also something that is interesting for me for me, for, for me to explore as I do this. Yeah, I, I remember this visual as well. So I think it's, uh, uh, you have on one side, you have uh, the, the way it should be, and then on the other, the other side, the way we do it, right? Yeah. Then yeah, I think it got quite uh, some engagement, right? People could relate to this thing. and. Uh, Okay. Yeah, so if I summarize, uh, so what you do is like every day you read things, you consume content, and then you keep a long list of things where, uh, like, okay, I read today, let's say, about uh, um, drift, right? And then you take a note. And then some things, they, uh, uh, you know, they, you see that they are more important, 
you read more about them, they are interesting for you, then you start spending more time uh, learning about them, and then you move them from the long list with ideas to the short list of ideas. And then from that short list, you take some ideas there and you start uh, trying to elaborate this idea, try to think about, uh, you know, how can you see the action there, how you extract the verb uh, from there, right? And then you also mentioned that there are two categories, uh, categories, uh, like two kinds of visuals, categories, um, uh, like a concepts, right? And then uh, this you also try to convey emotional aspect. Uh, did I summarize it correctly? So long list, short list, yeah. then getting some inspiration, uh, brainstorming, and then actually sitting down and creating the visual. Yeah, but to be frank, it doesn't always work that way. For example, while you're in the shower or while you're driving, so that's when the idea come to you. And it's, that's why it's handy for you to, to have a sketchbook that is dedicated. Like for me, I have like just dedicated for the visuals. Whenever I have the idea, no matter I have figured out the concept yet, I just draw what, what I, I, I think. And it's also useful for you to have like an app that you can immediately write down the ideas. For example, ideas that you don't have ideas for visuals yet, but you have something in mind, you just write it down. An app that is like for you to very quickly log in what you have uh, uh, you have thought uh, in your mind. So that, that has been handy for me as well. Do you use like a voice recorder or you type? So I, I type. Yeah, so what do you use for creating the actual visuals? So I use Figma. Um, so like I said, I'm, I don't have any background in, in design at all. So I'm a pure engineer. So I, was, I have been engineer, an engineer for, for many years. So I, I also don't, I mean, I wouldn't say I'm anywhere near the category of people who have these artistic skills, nothing like that. So uh, I've tried Canva before when during my days with uh, creating contents for for ad square so i use a lot of canva so that's when i i, I explored uh, that tool but um, it doesn't have that much flexibility so i've also tried illustrator adobe illustrator so that's way too advanced for me because it has all this learning curve that you have to go through before you can become comfortable in in the in the in, with using the tool but when i was introduced with figma and that again came from, from Jack uh, that he explains in his course that he was using this. It's like a sweet spot between Canva and Illustrator. So it's not that hard to operate, but you have a lot of uh, flexibility for you to be able to, to, to create designs that, that is exactly like what you want. So the learning curve is very not steep at all. Uh, you can get up and running in a couple of days. Uh, if I can do it, then I think most of other people can do it as well because um, yeah, I mean, I've only been exposed to Canva before and a little bit of Illustrator, not much. Then I went to Figma and I found like, wow, it's really something that uh, that 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 is interesting to me. There are other tools as well. For example, if you are because for me, my 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 approach is more on again being an engineer, more on the geometric uh, geometric shapes, uh, uh, vectors, uh, vector images. But there are other apps that if you are more artistic that you you prefer hand sketch, there are other tools as well. I can't remember the name now. Um, even Figma, but there are other, uh, sorry, I can't remember the name now, but there are, if you are more into hand sketch, there are other tools that it's not as hard as Photoshop Illustrator that you can get up and running uh, very quickly. So I've been using that, that um, since the beginning. Yeah. So you have a sketch note where you take sketches the moment you have an idea, or sometimes just uh, notes, right? And then you use Figma to actually create the, the visual, right? Or, yeah. Is, do you fir always first create a draft like on uh, on a piece of paper before moving to to Figma? Yeah, yeah. So most of the time, uh, I will write down on a paper first because um, because. Yeah, because it's, the idea is not really fully de developed yet. You have a basic concept of what you want to do, but for example, you haven't figured out what kind of object you're going to put, but you only, for example, have figured out the relationships. Yeah, like one thing is here, the other thing is there. You want to make an arrow, you want to create a contrast or something like that, uh, but you haven't figured out the, the, the end product yet. So once you put it down, somehow it's uh, ingrained in your mind when it comes to for you to to start processing in the back of your mind so like after a couple of days you start to to get or 
to figure out what you want to do, that's when I transfer to to Figma. But of course, again, it doesn't always, um, it's not always the case because sometimes you immediately get an idea and immediately I jump on Figma and for me to, for, to, do, to do it uh, immediately. And I think more and more now, because the amount of visuals that I've made has grown. So what I'm able to do now is that I have a lot of these existing assets that I can immediately just put, copy and paste from different concepts for me to, to create something new because it's not always the case that you're creating something from scratch. So you can utilize the kinds of objects, the kinds of I mean high level concepts that that you have from other visuals that you have made, and you reuse it and you modify it according to to the new thing that you want to to create. Mm -hmm. So if you need a catapult or a basket, you just go to that drift uh, uh, visual, right? You copy yeah. the catapult and you paste to the new yeah. image and use it. Yeah, that's cool. That's that's handy. Uh, yeah. So how for somebody who is uh, who is like you, who is an engineer? Who hasn't, uh, who have never worked with anything like Figma, who maybe doesn't even know who, what Figma is, how can they start um, creating visuals? Mm. How can they learn this? So, first take Jack's course. <laughs> so, I cannot high, mm. recommend it highly enough. But the, uh, yeah, so it's, again, it's very ironic because uh, Jack Butcher, he's someone who, who has been a designer for many years, like 10 years. But what he has taught me is that you don't have to be a designer to be able to create such visuals. Uh, in fact, I found that the, the, the bug that you have, which is not being able to, to uh, you don't have the designer brain, is, is that uh, it can turn into your biggest feature. Because the thing is that if you are focused on the design part, you are losing or you're not focusing as much on the message or the perspective that you want to convey. Because for me, that's the most important thing. Because what you want to do is you want to focus on the perspective uh, over the aesthetics. Because if you're focusing more on the aesthetics, like how does it look like, uh, how would it turn out, you don't spend as much time in terms of what you really want to, uh, for what you really want the people who look at your visual to be able to, to get. So the moment you, again, back to constraints, the moment you put this constraint, the moment you uh, understand that this is the, the level of aesthetic that you, can go and not beyond that. That's when you spend all your energy in trying to uh, deliver the perspective that you want to to convey. I, I found it very, uh, uh, yeah, very interesting to be able to get that perspective. Uh, that is actually something that will empower you. So that's that. So that's from the I guess philosophical aspect. But from the practical aspect, you just have to start uh, playing with things because. The moment you start to put things down, uh, that's when it will develop. And of course, it comes with practice. So um, like for me, I remember in the beginning, uh, I was very pumped up to start uh, creating such visuals because I got some like seven or 10 ideas that just came the moment I, I, I look at this, this other content from Jack and other creators like him. So I start to write down and I start to, to create these visuals uh, around 10 of them. And then I was ready to start posting. But then I thought to myself, uh, after that, what's next? <laughs> I don't have any idea for, for the rest of what I'm supposed to do. I only have this 10, but I totally ha don't have any idea uh, beyond that. So what I did, I just started posting. And that's when it slowly developed. And that's when more ideas start to come in. Uh, that's when I think you start to try to be able to, to relate to what you are learning instead of, for example, before when you are reading, consuming a content, you're just doing it just for consuming, but when you approach uh, or when you start to consume a content with the intention for you to create something, for you to learn and for you to explain to others using visuals, that's when that's when you you start to to get ideas coming in, and yeah, um, it will it will uh, yeah it will it will not stop. <laughs> yeah, you, did, you mentioned the think that uh, having a designer brain is helpful because you can focus on the message, not on aesthetics. And I remember, uh, well, even though I am not a designer, let's say when I need to create a presentation, I sometimes spend too much time on, you know, making the, like, I don't know, moving things there, making it look perfect, while what I should be doing instead is instead of, you know, creating a great slide, I should just focus on what I'm going to say in this slide, and maybe the slide can be just empty, right? Uh, 
so focusing on the message instead of focusing on how your slide looks like and here I think it's similar like you really focus on um, what you want to draw instead of how nice it looks and yeah and I, I also also realized that the other thing that the men you create such visuals that are minimal that are not really focusing on the aesthetics what you're doing really is you're respecting people's time um, because I mean yeah there are People are busy. They have so many things to to do in work and also to I mean for them to to what if they are learning, for them to consume content as well for, for them to understand concept. And the other thing again, this this other quote from Jack that I really found interesting is that what he's doing is that he's doing uh, he's working hard to give people less. So yeah, so I think that's the whole point. I mean you're respecting people's time because you are giving it as it is immediately what people want to uh, receive what people want to consume and converse I mean also on the other side you are help I mean you are uh, is being easy to yourself that means you are I mean you make your life easier because you are not really worried about things that are, you're not supposed to be worried you're just worried about things that you need to focus on which is again the message and the perspective and yeah so it seems to be a great combination. Yeah, and other thing you mentioned is consume with intention to create something. So mm -hmm. can, can you tell us how it works? So, so the same way I think is true for visuals and other other ways as well. So the moment the moment you consume a content with a view for you to explain or teach to others, your perspective becomes different because the moment you have the intention to teach. I mean, you're more invested because you're not really looking at the material on the surface. You're trying to dig deep. And if need be, you will look at other materials that are supplementing what you're trying to understand. And what happens to you is that you get to the bottom of what you want to know. And compare that with learning just for you to, for you to consume, your understanding first and foremost is totally different. You get a much deeper understanding. So let alone the the fact that you are going to create something uh, with visuals or anything the fact that you have the intention of explaining it to others while you're considering something makes it like at least 10 times more impact compared to to without it it's like the the best way to learn something is to teach it right yeah and uh, practically the way it works is let's say when you read an article you think okay this is a cool article if i wanted to explain this article in a single image, what this image would be, right? Or what's the main idea in this article that I can take away and turn this into a visual? Is it, uh, does it work like that? Yeah, because because when you're reading, uh, like you're, you're, you're consuming content, I mean, on a surface level, what you are getting is what, what it is. That's it, what it is. But if you are learning it with the intention of explaining it to others, what you try to get to the bottom at is also like what it is not uh, or what can go wrong what if you did that instead of what you are being shown so you start to look at other perspective and angle and not just be one dimensional when you consume uh, content so that's when you start to 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 try to 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 think how to instead of um, sorry in, uh, think of what if instead of instead of how to so yeah, so if you're given a step, right, how to do ABC, how to train a machine learning algorithm. So you have these steps, yeah, that's fine. But the moment you start to think about what can go wrong, what else is missing? What if I do it another way? What if I do it without machine learning? So those are normally things that you don't think about if you're just consuming, but if you are planning to teach it to others, definitely those are the things that you will definitely need to keep in mind that you will uh, explore and try to discover. How do you find... Uh... How do you come up with this what if things or well, what can go wrong? Like if you have practical experience, then maybe you can use this practical experience. But if you're just learning this thing, how can you know about these things? Mm, so I guess if you are talking about, I mean, coding for, for, for machine learning, right? You just explore ways how to break, uh, break <laughs> a code. For example, you take uh, someone something that someone else has done. For example, he shares a quote on a medium blog. For example, right, with with uh, the person shares something that over there and with a quote example. So you try not just to run the code, but also try to make changes and see what if I you were to change this parameter. What if you were to change this even algorithm? And uh, I mean, the many thousand things that you can change and see 
what happens. So you start to think about, because the, your goal now is to be able to understand in totality, not just how it's being presented to you. So you are forcing yourself to look at it from, from different ways and try to really nail down your understanding. Yeah, thanks. So since 2019, you said you, uh, you're you self-employed, so you don't work for, you don't have, uh, like, you don't work for a company, you work for yourself. And uh, I think you mentioned you were doing some sort of consulting training, but also, uh, I guess, making visuals is part of uh, what you do. So you're making some money with uh, your visualization skills. Can you tell us more how you earn money with this? Yeah, so now it's slowly becoming one of the main things that I'm doing these days. Uh, so starting early this year, I've started to introduce this visual design service um, that helps uh, companies, content creators, who has a message that want to turn that message into visual so that they can, uh, uh, so, then the, so that the audience that they, that, that are, I mean, uh, consuming the content and trying to understand their products and services be able to get immediately what uh, they are trying to uh, to serve and the value proposition and so on and so forth. So currently I'm working mostly with um, machine learning and data platform startups that are looking to, to grow their business and even content creators who are trying to, uh, that are currently mostly um, creating text-based content who also wants to, 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 to expand that into visual content for them to be able to, to deliver what they, uh, their message in a more, more clear way. So that's something that I've been doing uh, since the beginning of the year. So it's something that is very enjoyable for me because not just from my own perspective, but also from what the other party wants to convey from, from what, what, uh, what they have. And in a way, it's also a challenge for me as well because there are, there, are, there are new things that I need to explore, that I need to force myself to understand because, I mean, different companies, for example, if you're talking about machine learning companies, so there are companies that are doing data platforms, there are companies that do explainability, there are companies that do um, uh, ML ops end-to-end. -end. So, yeah, so before I can help them with creating visuals, I need to be able to understand their product offering as first and foremost. So of course that takes some ramping up for me to to uh, to uh, for me to ramp up uh, my understanding first and foremost. But of course it's a rewarding journey as well because I get to understand uh, in a, in a more intimate way compared to just looking at it from 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 outside. So yeah, so that's something that I've been doing a lot more these days compared to what I used to do before. So you first started publishing these visualizations uh, on uh, social media on LinkedIn, Twitter. And then did companies start to reach out to you or how did you make it clear that you're, this is something you can offer and they can come to you for these kind of services? Yeah, so it started with um, people, I mean, companies and people starting to reach out to me to, to ask if I do such services. Initially, I didn't do any because I was just doing it for, for myself. So I started to see interest. So I thought as well for me to, to, to work together with them. So start, yeah, um, what I've been doing in the past uh, few months is that I've started to do some kind of outbound, uh, reach out to people and companies that might be interested. And yeah, so, so slowly uh, building that, that service side of, uh, of the business. Yeah, that's interesting. So basically first you started, you didn't start with intention of earning money, but you started with the intention of you know, exploring this area, using this skill, trying to convey your message. And you mentioned that you were also learning or relearning machine learning. So for you, it was just a way to consume and sort of regurgitate the content, right? And then show, this is my vision, this is my take on these things. And then you did this regularly. And then at some point, companies noticed this and thought, okay, this is so cool. We also want to have something similar. We want to somebody to come to us, listen to what we do, and explain it in a simple visual, right? Oh, cool. And uh, one thing you mentioned that uh, sometimes there is a, a bunch of text-based information, I imagine an article, and then you think how to add visuals to this article, right? Did I yeah. uh, understand correctly that companies sometimes come to you with uh, for this service? Yeah, so, so there you... are, for example, there are companies that have blog posts Mm -hmm. that explains uh, a concept that they want to convey or product or service. So yeah, so to add a visual to that 
basically to summarize whatever that they are trying to deliver in that in that blog blog content. So there are also companies that uh, want to create like marketing material as well. Uh, there are companies who want to who are creating ebooks, uh, like downloadable ebooks that explain concept. So adding visuals will really uh, give a greater impact into what what um, what they want to 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 explain in 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 that material. What paper, for example. And there are a few other ways as well that I'm 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 currently working on. Mm -hmm. Cool. And this is all without having a designer background and being mm -hmm. an engineer. Can you maybe tell us a bit about this? So you get an article which is just text, a wall of text and nothing. I imagine that for me as a reader, this is probably a boring article because I cannot skim it. I have no idea what it is. And then it must be quite interesting for me to actually convince myself and invest time in reading this article. And when I create content, I understand that I need to make it easier to to scheme, to understand what uh, this is. But I always have problems with, okay, I have this piece of text. How do I add visuals there? How do I add instructions there or illustrations there? Do you have some suggestions for people like me who can come up with text uh, but struggle with coming up with illustrations? Hmm. So what has worked well for me, and it's also the same way like if I were to consume the content myself, is that so first you take a first pass on, on the text. And what you do is you try to extract the keywords, like the top four or five keywords that is always appearing and the keyword that you, you think um, the, the is the key message of, let's say, a blog post, for example. So once you have listed down all the keywords, back to the idea that I was uh, explaining about just now is that you try to understand not just what they are, but what they mean, what they're trying to convey. And more often than not, you'll be able to find a theme of what they're trying to do. Let's say, for example, um, you're talking about the solution, a data platform that is trying to reduce the number of steps for, for some and I mean a, a, a non-technical person to be able to access the data from four steps into two steps. So what you can probably do is something like uh, uh, a comparison of like the number of hooks, the number of uh, steps that the person needs to take with without the solution. For example, you just draw it like that. And then on the other side, it's like, you know, just take two steps, as simple as that. So that's a simple example, but you can always play around with many different, uh, different kinds of concept. For example, uh, is it a cycle? Uh, is it about contrast between a concept and the other concept. So you can, for, for contrast, you can talk about like, um, you, took, you can talk about like black and white. So you can imagine, you can immediately tell that one concept is totally different from the other while being in the same um, space, for example. And there are other things like uh, balance that I mentioned just now. You can imagine a scale that talks about one concept that is more important than the others, or even if they are the same. Many, many objects that you can think of, like slider, if you're talking about a spectrum of different ways for you to do things, and you want to convey that actually you need to put the slider somewhere in the middle or somewhere to the, to the right to convey that, yeah, that's the kind of emphasis that you need to put whenever you're considering the two concepts. So there are a number of ways um, that you can, you can play around. And yeah, with trial and error, you will normally be able to find it eventually. Mm -hmm. And so pass over an article extract four or five keywords and then try to understand what is the key message, uh, what is uh, what is the main takeaway from the article for the reader, right? And then you try to visualize it, um, follow, um, and I guess follow the same process as we discussed like half an hour ago, right? Okay, and this is this way you create a visual for the entire article, right? But what, uh, let's say you have uh, one paragraph that explains some, something else, one section, then another section that is maybe talking about a li little bit different thing. I guess you apply the same process, right? You take a section, you try to understand what is the key message of this section, and then you try to come up with a visual that illustrates this key concept. Is it correct? Yeah, so there, I mean, there is a, a point where you can create, like what you mentioned is a long form kind of visual instead of just one visual, like maybe five or more visuals that that are in the same same um, article or content so there is a point where you can relate these visuals but there is a point like exactly what you said that 
the concepts are totally different that you cannot really relate them. Yeah, I mean, in that case, you cannot push yourself and try to create something mm -hmm. because now you're diluting the value. Uh, I think the most important is for you to be able, number, number one is for you to be able to deliver the message efficiently. And the bonus, if you can be able to relate different concepts, like if you were to split different visuals into different concepts, I think that would be a bonus. I think one example that I um, managed to do it is uh, by, by talking about this concept about uh, data science or machine learning that essentially it boils down to just five kinds of questions or five kinds of problems that it wants to solve like classification, regression, anomaly detection, clustering, and also reinforcement learning. So just, I mean, any machine learning problem, you can boil or categorize them into this, these different categories. So these are the, this, this, this article from Microsoft. So I figured out a way for me to be able to really relate this, this, um, these different five concepts using the same base visuals, which is like the same kinds of data points and imposing different perspectives according to each of the five concepts so that people can relate it. Because if you have the visual, but different visuals for different concepts, it doesn't give as much in impact, but, but yeah, if you can somehow relate them, because there is a logical uh, connection over there, even though yeah, it's not that easy to come up with that immediately, but if you think through about it, yeah, if you can manage to relate them, I think there's a bonus. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I also know that you wrote a book because you recently came to Data Talks uh, Club Slack and you answered questions about your book. So can you tell us uh, about your book and how did you come up with the idea behind the book? So same thing is first and foremost for me to be able to nail my understanding of the concept. So by writing the book, it forces me to uh, really get to the, the, the bottom in terms of understanding the concept from the ground up. For example, um, not relying on frameworks such as TensorFlow or PyTorch, but instead building a simple neural network from scratch, including doing all this back propagation and all the, the, I mean, the materials from scratch. And that's, is forcing me to, I mean, I mean, the fact that I, I, I'm looking to, to create the book forces me to, to do all these, these uh, steps. And that of course gave me the idea of, of creating content that is based on the journey that, that, that I went through uh, by learning the, the, the material. Um, because um, I find that deep learning and neural networks is especially interesting because it's, a, it's Compared to other algorithms, of course, you're talking if you're talking about applications, if you're talking about the kinds of um, excitement that is that is that is here today, there's something else. But I'm talking more about like how it's very modular. It's something that you can start simple that you can build upon. So I thought that it would be an interesting idea for me to try to create like a book that explains the concept from the ground up because you can you can expand from as much as you can from a very simple neural network, which is a single neuron. So how do you start from a single neuron to a, like a, a neural network with just one hidden layer to an even bigger neural network? So it all starts with a single neuron and you're basically having these Lego bricks that you can build and make a big, a big, uh, a big Lego structure. So yeah, I thought that that would be a natural way, a natural uh, subject for me to convert that into a visual way of explaining things. And and yeah, by writing the book, I, I mean, of course, it, it forms up my understanding as well. But I think the other part that is interesting to me is that I, 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 I can, I was, I was able to to connect the different concepts together, and um, be able to come up with this with this uh, end to end so called story. Because the other thing that I've also uh, I tried to do, and whenever I'm creating content or any material, is that I try to. Uh, tie together the whole thing into a story that people can navigate and people can have a logical flow, flow from start to finish. So that's what I've uh, I've tried to do with, with this book. Hmm. Yeah. Did you first come up with text and then created illustrations or you first came up with illustrations and then wrote some text around them? Um, so, so I started with the concepts, the big concepts, and then I start to create visuals. I start to, for example, imagine the number of pages, the number of sections. Then I make this 
placeholders for me to draw these visuals and then I start to fill in based on the concept. Then only uh, I add the, the text that explain, explain the each of the visual. Because if you look at the book, the text is actually very minimal. So it is, it's, it's, uh, it's, um, uh, I'm hoping for people who don't have that much time for them to digest the content, but uh, can get enough value to understand the concept. So it's visuals first and supplemented by just concise uh, text. So, so that's the text part is something that I do after I've, I've, I've firmed up the logical steps on, on uh, creating, creating the, the content. And I think we forgot to mention the name of the book. So the name is A Visual Introduction to Deep Learning. Right? Yeah. Uh, I think we should be wrapping up. Uh, do you want to say anything before we finish? I think that's it. So I think, uh, of, of course, I want to thank you for, for having me here. It's really a pleasure. Thanks for joining this talk. So yeah, um, I also follow Data Talks Club for, for some time already. And I really admire the work that you're doing uh, with the community, with the, the effort that you have and the, the kind of content that you are creating is really helping a lot of people to ramp up in this, in this industry. So yeah, thanks also to you for, for creating all this. Yeah. Thanks. So how can people find you? LinkedIn, Twitter, right? Yeah, people can find me on LinkedIn, uh, Mio Ami. Or if you, if, if you want to look at the visuals that I've made, you can easily go to the website, kdimensions.com. So there I've already created the, not all, but most of the visuals that I've done. Uh, and if you'd like to also find out about the book as well as the, the, the visual design service that I, 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 I have, there's also more information there. Uh, on the website. It's kdimensions.com, right? Yeah. I just put a link. But you'll also share all the links uh, with me and then I'll put them in the description. Sure. Okay. I think that's uh, all for today. So thanks again for joining us, for sharing uh, your expertise with us. And thanks everyone for joining us as well, for watching us. And um, have a great weekend, everyone. Yeah. Thank you. Goodbye.